Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Good morning and welcome to this service of worship this morning, streaming from Trinity United Methodist Church here in Little Rock. I'm Roy Smith and it's my joy to be the pastor at Trinity, a place that, uh, that honors and loves all people and, and, and prayer is at the center of our life together. And I hope that you'll find there on the screen our address where you can send prayer requests, prayer at tumclr.org. And we appreciate that and want to share that. I hope also, and I say this often, but I want you to be sure that you're receiving our blast. On Tuesday, our e-blast now shares with you a prayer that you can use in your own devotions as well as our prayer list for you to remember. And, and then our Friday e-blast is a great way to know what's going on. On Tuesday morning, we've been opening our sanctuary as a time when you can come in uh, and share just a time here in this beautiful uh, holy space uh, of meditation and prayer together. Uh, we invite you to come in and enter through the narthex doors on the evergreen side. Um, this month, uh, during the month of June, we're receiving canned vegetables for the, uh, for the food pantry. And we're, I'm looking at the, at the shelf from here and I can see some room. There's, you can still bring it. We've still got room. We look forward to you doing that. And then we appreciate so much you all uh, that are watching on Facebook or, or YouTube as you press share because you're able to then tell others and share with others about this uh, time of worship. Today, as part of our service, we're going to be, um, oh, Thank you for your gifts, and you can, you can give online. I forgot that one. Uh, and thank you so much for that. Uh, we've been able to, to uh, be blessed by your gifts that you continue to do. On Friday evening of this week, we shared a time with our confirmation class in which they professed their faith uh, in Christ after their year-long study and discipleship. And part, as, as part of this service today, toward the end, you're going to be able to see the part of that where they actually are making their vows in profession. I wanted you to have a chance, as we shared with, uh, with Jay, our youth minister, and Ann, our children's minister, and Dean Hicks, their leader, and me, as representatives of all of us, and then some family members who gathered. I wanted you to be able to share that, so you'll be able to see that. And then stay tuned because we're going to have, you have a wonderful postlude uh, in which Hee Kyung and her husband Chai will be playing the organ and the piano. It's a lovely thing. And we begin now as we turn our hearts toward God and prepare to worship with this beautiful piano solo by uh, Chai.
beautiful. Thank you. The Bible is filled with promises uh, to us from God. And, and one of the promises that Jesus makes is when we gather, whether two or three, there's a few more than that helping make this service happen here. But we are gathered in Jesus' name to worship, that his presence will be with us. Let's remind ourselves that it is God's promises on which we stand as we sing our opening hymn together, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises sing. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Well, that was beautiful music. Thank you all. Hey, friends, how are you this morning? I'd like for you to um, be aware that Vacation Bible School, we're doing it a little bit differently this year. It's called Staycation Bible School because we'll be staying at home. And it's time to register. By registering, we know that you'd like one of the activity um, kits that we're preparing. It has your craft in it, your daily um, reading, some things for reflection, uh, one science experiment, and some fun food stuff. So register so that we'll know that you want one of those. Um, vacation or Staycation Bible School is going to be um, July the 13th through the 17th at 9 o'clock to 10.30 each morning. So I hope that you'll join us for that. All right. Our scripture this morning is um, just a simple um, interaction between God and Abraham. And God said to Abraham, Abraham? And A Abraham answers him, here I am. So the story goes on 
that God asked Abraham to give him the one thing that he loves the most. And you know, Abraham loves God so much, he doesn't ask any questions. He doesn't try to back out of it or beg God to change his mind. He just complies. He just obeys. He trusts God, and he knows that um, God loves him and wants the best for him, and he will provide. So Abraham follows and does exactly as um, God has asked him. So, you know, each day for us, there's a measure of trust that we start our day with. Trust that we can get out of bed, that we'll have food to eat, that we'll have our family around us, that we'll have a safe home to live in. And you know, parents also have a measure of trust. Trust in you and in God that when they send you out to school or to play in the yard, that you'll make good decisions and follow the rules and that you'll return home to them safely and with happy stories to tell. Did she know that God trusts us also? He does. He trusts that we love him and that we're continuing to learn about him so that when he asks us to do something, we can obey him and do just as he's asked, just as Abraham did. Let's pray together this morning. Did you pray hands, please? Dear God, we trust and obey you because we love you. In all that we do, we want to please you. Amen. We come to God this morning in this time of prayer, and I want to invite you into a moment of silence and then this time of prayer together. Let us pray. Holy God, we come before you this morning at this time uh, of worship together. We come together and, um, and recognize that this is a time that um, there's a certain unsettledness, a, a certain uh, uh, amount of that which is not exactly known. We continue to mourn with families uh, who are losing uh, to death members of their family and communities that are finding themselves very stressed, not just in our country, but around the world, by the number of people uh, for whom they are to care. And so we pray that you will be with all who seek to care for those whose lives are being affected by a pandemic, which is really a worldwide event. And we pray that um, you will continue to be with those whose research is done for the greater good uh, for all of us. We pray that you will be with uh, our leaders of government, that they can learn to work uh, in conjunction with uh, all the people and seek to lead, that we can uh, respond as your people, uh, as, as, as children of yours, that we seek to care for one another. Because there are times in our lives, and, and we're reminded of this by the story from, from Abraham that we're seeing today, in, in, which, in which we go forth and we don't know exactly what is in front of us. We simply know that you are leading us. And what we must do is to trust you, that you will provide and that you will be present and that you will truly never let us go. So, Lord, kindle in us a newfound spirit. Kindle in us that desire to serve you, 
to live peacefully with our neighbors, to all your creation, and, and to serve Christ in every way that we can. We come, O oh God, this morning uh, in our congregation, and we are so deeply grateful for these, uh, young, uh, th these young people that have been part of our confirmation journey this year. And we commend them to you and give thanks for their faith and all who love them and have nurtured them. May we continue to nurture their faith with Briley, with Carson, with Caden, and with Mason. We give you thanks for them and for their life of faith and commitment to follow you. And pray that you will continue to give us eyes of faith and hearts to trust that we can be your hands and feet in the world in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. summer, we're uh, looking at our sermons at uh, members of our, our, our spiritual ancestors, if you will, Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca and Rachel and Jacob and Esau and Leah and all the rest. As I've said before, these stories are ancient, but they are extremely fresh, for they help us to discover uh, what it means to follow God, uh, sometimes uh, faithfully and sometimes as we sort of follow Him in a circuitous route. But in all of this, we, we remember that we are discovering more about who is God and who are we as, as humans and how do we connect. And it all begins, you remember, as God comes to Abraham and says, I want to make, I'm going to make you the father of a great nation, give you a land, and through you the nations of the world will be blessed. Follow me. And so there's a kind of obedience and trust from the very beginning that we see happening. As we watch the story unfold, it's like watching and reading and learning more about our own families. 
uh, as we learn about ancestors, we recognize there were all kinds of moments on the journey. Some were full of joy and some were great challenges and some had incredible intensity and some were real test. And so it is that we discover today uh, one of what I think is one of the more intense stories in the entire Bible. It's an intense story, intense in the same way that when Jesus goes the night before the crucifixion and, and prays there at the Garden of Gethsemane, there's a kind of real test, a real deep questioning of, what, of whether Abraham in this case or Jesus will follow and do as God has called him. And so we see in that sort of wrestling, that sort of intensity, a very deep kind of anguish, but one that we discover that God is there throughout it all. So here are these words from uh, Genesis chapter 22. So after these things, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. And God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled the donkey, took two of the young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and then he set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day of their travels, Abraham looked up and he saw the place far away. And he said to the young men, stay here with the donkey and the boy and I will go over there and worship and then we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac to carry. And, Jacob, and Abraham carried the fire and the knife, and they walked on together. And then Isaac said to his father, Father, here I am, son. He said, the fire is here, the wood is here, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said to him, God himself will provide a lamb for the offering. And the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown them, Abraham built an altar and laid the wood there. And then he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And he reached out his hand and took the knife and would kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And the angel said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God alone and would not even withhold your only son from him. And Abraham looked up and there was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham took that ram and he offered it as the burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the place, he called the place the Lord will provide for he said, on this mountain, the Lord has truly provided. And this is the word of God for us. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Oh God, we pray that you will help us uh, to see in the midst of a very difficult story, to see you clearly and to understand you more fully, that we might follow you more nearly. In Christ our Lord. Amen. This story begins and the crisis is just immediate. As Abraham hears this word that calls on him to take his son and make him an offering. And so Abraham, he takes the, the boy and the, the two men and the donkey and the wood and the fire and that little sort of can that they would carry it in. And they begin to travel. One of the things I find so interesting about this story is how scarce the details are, but how vividly clear it is in my mind. I think part of that is because uh, if you look it up, and you could do this on your phone, uh, and I don't know if you are because you're at home, uh, so, but 
the artists, the number of artists that have sought to try to make sense and, and to illustrate the story is just staggering. And, and, it, and it's interesting because each of them helps us to see the anguish in this. But the details are sort of stark but, and few, but this, the reality is very clear. So, so Abraham, and they, they make their journey. They've gone about three days, and he sees this mountain, Mount Moriah. And, and there he says to the young man, you wait here, and the boy and I, we will go ahead and, and, and make our offering. And so they do. And it's interesting that he said, and we will return to you. Now, I don't know what to make of that. I don't know whether he's being optimistic, but I think we see more clearly what, 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 what Abraham really is about. Because I think that as he and Isaac are walking and continue to walk, and you know, some translations call Isaac a lad. So I think he's probably a young teenager at this age, okay? It's about how old he is. And he's going along, and, and we haven't heard him speak before, and he says, Father, yes, here I am. Third, one of three times we hear that. Father, here I am. We got wood, we got a knife, we got a fire. We don't have a, we don't have a, we don't have a lamb. And what does Abraham say? I think this is the most important line in it. Abraham says to his son, God himself will provide the lamb. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that Abraham says this, and it's not like he's been clued in somehow, like, don't worry, it's just all a big show. God didn't do that. This is real. But somehow, Abraham, in spite of the evidence, in, in spite of knowing that he's got this one son that's been named as heir to the promise that God has given him, he, he knows that there seems to be no logical way this can work, but yet he trusts for he knows that it is God alone that he trusts. And then he binds Isaac and he, he takes the knife. There's a picture uh, that, that Rembrandt painted of this uh, moment. And, 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 and as I read the story of when the angel of the Lord comes to deliver God's message, it, I, I read that and I see the action of that story. You know how things go in slow motion? sometimes in your mind or in your experience when things kind of slow down. And it's one of those moments. And, and Rembrandt catches this beautifully because in the picture that Rembrandt shows of Isaac there on the wood and Abraham, the knife is literally falling to the ground in midair. And there in the background, you can see it's kind of faint, but you see it when you look at it closely. There's the ram that the angel points out to him. The lamb that he slays. It's an incredible story, and it confounds us because I don't think we know quite what to do with God testing this way, and there's a sense that it feels unreasonable and very difficult. I don't know exactly. It doesn't say why he has the test. I don't know what would have happened if Abraham had said, you know, I've been thinking about this, God, but there's one boy here and one promise. I don't believe we can make those two work. We don't know any of that stuff because that's not what happens. I don't know why a 13-year-old boy didn't just knock the old man down and run off. <laughs> Except that I think he understood something about what was going on at a level beyond what he could understand. But one of the things that happens in this moment is some incredible sort of clarity about what matters. You know, the Israelites would live, uh, as they came back from Egypt and settled in the Promised Land, about, about a lot of different peoples. And a lot of them practiced the sacrifice of humans, including children. It was terrible. And one of the things that, that the Israelites understood, and you hear it in the psalmist words, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken and contrite spirit. It's what you all sang about this morning. That's what matters. That's what matters. And it becomes so clear in this moment. I think, though, the other thing is that we have to see clearly again those words that Abraham, he's not being clueless and he's not just being optimistic. Oh, I bet everything's going to work out just fine. He's not being magical in his thinking when he says, God will provide. There is a kind of trust in the loyalty and the, pro and the poverty of God that Abraham cannot cannot fathom, but knows is true. 
that God is utterly reliable, utterly reliable and graciously faithful. And so it is that the one who tests becomes the one who provides. The one who tests is the one who provides. There is a sense that God has taken a great risk in asking Abraham to step out in faith to the ultimate extreme. And yet God, Abraham has taken a risk that this God he has chosen to follow from Ur to Haran to Canaan will provide and do what God says. That's an incredible sort of understanding of who God is and who we are and how deeply and graciously God looks at us and cares for us. And so what do we do with that? Well, we live in a, in a, a kind of amazingly interesting and confusing and overwhelming time, a pandemic, a pandemic, where the whole world is in it and nobody, in spite of how bored we get with it or how much we want to be in control, can say, we're done with that. It's not finished with us. We live in a time in our own country when we are really taking a careful look <clears throat> at who we are and the disparities of race in our country and what does it mean for us to live and make visible and real the kind of, uh, the kind of goals, the kind of beliefs, the kind of principles that we espouse, that they become real. Uh, we are wrestling with big things right now. And, and part of what the pandemic especially, it call at all, at both, both issues, they call for us to have deep concern for others as well as ourself, but not in a selfish way. And so we're asked to wear masks and we're asked to be distant and we're asked for changes in our behavior. But in all of that, we are doing it for a larger purpose. We may get tired of it, we may not be sure that what I do really matters. We may really not care. We may decide that I'm just tired of being good and disciplined and I'm just done with it. Or we don't, we don't like doing challenging things for a long time. That's just not really what our society values. But I think it's a question is, do we care enough for others to do what it takes? You know, in our, in our relationships and lives, there are tests of our uh, loyalty that happen. And, and depending on, on how important the relationship is and the expectations for it, helps you to understand how deep those loyalty tests really are. In the story that we look at today with Abraham, we have seen as deep a test as anyone has ever asked. The thing, I think you said it so well, Anne, when you said it for the children, the thing you love the very most the thing you love the very most. How deep is that loyalty? And to what? As Christians, our loyalty is to God. And, and, and one of the reasons that we're able to do that is that we follow the risen one who came as the gift from God. In Christ, whose life is ended there on the cross, we realize that there seems to be no grounds for anything else to happen because dead people stay dead until God says there is another way to see. And our faith and trust in the power of the resurrection and in God and new life against every deadly circumstance is what we claim as people of the resurrection. We believe and we claim that God, in spite of the evidence, in spite of the deadly circumstances, that God will find a way to bring life. And with it, hope and love and mercy and grace and justice. What God needs for us to do is what Abraham did. Here I am, Lord. Let me be and do what you have called me to be and do, a disciple of the risen one who has shown us life in all of its fullness. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Thank you so much. Our Christian journey begins in the waters of baptism. And as we continue through our life, we experience the power of God along the way. Each year for our sixth graders, we have a confirmation experience in which they spend the school year learning together about our faith and sharing in service projects and other kinds of experiences for learning. I'm so grateful to uh, Dean Hicks, a member of our church who leads our Sunday morning experiences for them and has done so for many, many years. At the end of the confirmation experience, they have the, the chance to stand and say, I believe, and to take those vows that in each of their cases were made at their baptisms and claim them for their own selves as a professing member of the family of faith in God. This year, it was, it was wonderfully interesting as, can you go back one picture? I don't know, oh, just, anyway, that Carson and Briley, who are right beside uh, me and, and in the middle, our first cousins, and they were baptized on the very same day and confirmed on the Sunday, which was really powerful. And their family was here, four generations of their family that are members of Trinity. It was great to have Mason as well, uh, who, who is, and I'll introduce him in a second, but, and his grandparents were able to surround him uh, as well as uh, those of us that stood there. And, and one of the things that we'll look forward to, Caden Helms is the other member of the class. Go ahead and share the pictures, the next picture. Yeah, Carson uh, Breden Steiner is, uh, is one of the members of the class that appreciates so much his, his journey. Caden Helm, and we'll be sharing a time with Caden uh, and his family uh, later. They weren't able to join us Friday. Briley Switzer, uh, and we, it was great to be with her and her family uh, on Friday. And then Mason Gooch um, was there as well. Now, yeah, and now what I want you to do is to uh, see our, uh, the part of our service. We began with the service of baptismal renewal, and then we began uh, this service of confirmation itself. So listen and watch as these three young people make their profession of faith in Christ. It's the family of God in our faith. At a time like this, a time of confirmation, we reaffirm the faith that is ours and that we have grown to hold and claim as our own. And we renew that covenant that was declared at our baptism. And we acknowledge what God is doing. And we affirm our commitment to so now I want to ask you, Mason, Carson, and Brian, these questions. And I stand on behalf of the whole church and I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil power of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Yeah, I do. That you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and put your whole trust in His grace. Promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. I do. And now, will all of you who are here continue to continue to support and encourage Riley? Thanks for your time. Now, I invite you as we share, and, 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 and it's in the bulletin if you'd like it, but I'm gonna, we're going to share of the Apostles' Creed, the statement of faith that we use in worship. But I'm going to do it as three questions, a little different than we did in So that's why you might want to look. <laughs> First of all, do you believe in God the Father? I believe, I believe in God, God the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. 
Okay, I'm going to put on my mask for this because I'm going to come out with it. And I, I realize that the pocket on my robe is here for a purpose. Just to tuck your hands. <laughs> of course. Anyway, for being conscious, we should be. Usually I invite you to kneel and I stand right in front of you, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I'm going to come and stand beside you and offer a prayer. Mason Gooch, may the Holy Spirit descend into your heart and dwell there forever, as you have affirmed and promised to follow him as your Savior and as a disciple of Jesus. May the Spirit fill you this day and always. Amen. Carson, may the Holy Spirit fill you. May the Holy Spirit be your guide and your teacher, as Jesus has promised. And may you know the strength of that spirit and the joy of being surrounded by family, the family of faith, both those in your, in your blood family, but also in your church family. May you know their strength each day. Amen. And Briley, may the Holy Spirit descend into your heart and dwell there. May you know its strength. May you know it as teacher. May you know it as friend. And may you know the joy of what it means to have support from, what it, from those around you, your family, but also our larger family of faith, which is the church. May you know that joy, the joy of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now, one of the things that we've done just now is you've affirmed faith in Jesus. You've said that you will follow him as disciple. But one of the things that we learn is that it helps to find a church to do that in. So the next question I want to ask you is one about the church. As a member of the universal church, the body of Christ, those who have said yes to Jesus as Lord and seek to live as disciples, Will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? Thank you. And as a member of Trinity United Methodist Church, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Yes. yes. Friends, members of the House of the Faith, I commend to you Mason, Carson, and Briley. I commend them to your love and care, as you, in particular, have done so much for them already. I want you to do all you can to help increase their faith, confirm their hope, and help them grow more full and perfect in their love in this world. You know, one of the things that I always find to be uh, interesting in a moment like this is that the journey that we have as Christians is not just a one-time thing, but as Eugene Peterson wrote once, to be a disciple is a long obedience in the same direction. One of the things I like to say is that we have to be Christians on purpose. That is to say, we have to make decisions, but we have to choose to live and follow what we know and as we learn more. And, and the other thing is that it's a lifelong commitment that we continue on uh, this journey. Owen, how, when, when did you first make a profession of faith? I'm not sure. But, uh, about? Uh, when I was about eight years old, I yeah. think. Yeah. So you've been at it for a while. <laughs> so you see, it's a journey that doesn't stop. There'll be ups and downs, but one of the things we know is that God will be with us, and God will always be our strength. Let us pray. Holy God. This is a special moment in time, and for this we give you thanks. It's an unusual time. It's a time when uh, we are learning new things about what it means to be faithful to you. And they're right in the middle of it. Mason, Carson, and Brian. We are grateful for, uh, for your love that in spite of the challenges of life is always with us. So continue to reach out, to touch, Fill these, fill these years with your spirit, your grace, your truth, and your strength as we seek to be disciples of Jesus. And before
before we go, we offer together as a statement of our faith and unity of our faith the words of the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Heaven, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power glory forever. Amen. May God, who is eternal, may he fill you with his love. And may you be those that will be generous friends and those who share the love of God in the world. And with the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, by the blessing of God who created us, redeemed us, sustained you. all of us, that we may live and share the gospel in our lives and know that Christ is our companion and our strength. Amen. Amen. Abraham heard the Lord and he said, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He heard his son Isaac who said, Father, and he said, here I am. And then the angel of the Lord came a last time to show him a way to see the ram the Lord had brought him and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. These three young people have said, here I am. And now we get to join them in our closing hymn. Here I am, Lord. Let's sing together.
go. Go forth and serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. And by the love of God, the peace of God, the power of God sustain you this day and always. Amen.